was on my phone. Wow. I didn't know you had even gray hair. <laughs> and now and I, then, now. Um, once I switched the phone service, that's when everything went downhill. Yeah, yeah. Makes perfect sense. That's what happened. We already recording, so just an FYI, man. Cool, cool, cool. The streets, the streets need tweet talks. Right, 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 right. Can't, beep, beep. can't, can't go a whole week without it. Yeah, people have been tuning in, man. It's really cool. Strangers, strangers out here, like, oh, that's Raphael. That's work, money, life. <laughs> yeah, I see, man. People every day just um, follow it. I, at first, it was like people keep following like out of nowhere because I wasn't tweeting for a while. I'm like, yeah. Ah, the show. Yeah, man. That's what happens when you put that content out there. It lives and breathes even when you're like sleeping and not moving. Right. So, right. yep. Shout out Big Baller Brand. I actually bought this shirt this time last year. They had a Black Friday sale. All their stuff was like half off. And I was like, let me get a shirt. <laughs> Big Baller Brand. Yeah. Uh, they sh- did they shut that down and restart or something? I don't know what, I don't know what they're doing. I have no idea, but I, I was going to talk about that is like in business, you got to have longevity. You got to have stand power. You can't just hope to ride a quick wave and make a few bucks. Like there's so many other athletes that could be falling under the big ball of brand that it's like, yeah, Lonzo, he might not know any better. He might want to leave, but other, other athletes could use that sponsorship, a black owned sponsorship. It has some fire shoes. It has some good looking stuff, man. You're only gonna get better. Build business. Right. Amazon's a 30 year old company, man. 30 years. We over here like, oh, my company ain't booming in 30 months. It's a wrap. If they even give it 30 months, they give it like 30 days. So big baller brand. Shout out big baller brand. Hopefully they can bring it back. Yeah, man. I like the I like the concept. Yep. Anyway, tweet talk episode 24. It's lit. Episode Kobe. Yeah, good to go, man. The streets need tweet talks. The streets need it, man. Yeah, you're going to get back on that consistent grind now. We got to get some more uh, guests on here. I see so many people that could come on. Um, we got we to gotta get Xavier on. He's always getting a few viral tweets, you know. He gets a viral tweet every single day. So we got to get him on talk about some of his stuff. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hit him up. You, you're definitely good at the outreach. You're yeah, like I'm a master. There's a couple of people that I want to out, I reach out to, but their DMs are not open. I'm like, oh, That's man. Probably I don't want to be, I don't probably wanna probably be like. Follow you. Uh-huh. DMs closed. Yeah, kind of weird. Like uh, Jamel, uh, the, the one that builds the smart houses. Yep, yep, yep. His DMs are closed. Anyway, I'll get to him. I'll get to him, man. Man. Woo. So turkey day is over. Yep. Time for people to wake up. Time for wake up. So you got to want to kiss, kick this off with this tweet. Say, get you some skills, fam. Skills equal job security. Um. So I guess like the root of that, it just had to do with how I've seen people in my firm because my firm is two sides to the firm. There's a pre-lit side and there's an actual litigation side. Litigation side deals with the actual attorneys, the law clerks, the paralegals, all that stuff. Pre-lit is just people who are getting on the phone and negotiating these cases. That's all they do is negotiation. It's basically sales. And what I found is that on that side, they go through people like crazy. But on our side, either they don't like you, they can't fire you. Even if they don't like you, because you're not easily replaceable. And so what I found is that, like, when you have skills, when you have credentials, when you have something behind your last name, people think twice when it's time to let you go. Whereas if you work a sales job where you're on the, where you're just a, a, a body at that point in time, anybody can do sales, then you run the risk of, uh, uncertainty. And so that's one of the things that I realized when um, I used to work in investment sales. I had an undergrad degree in finance and 
I knew that all the jobs they were giving me were sales jobs. And I was like, this dude didn't go to school and get a degree in finance. This dude doesn't have an MBA. He just had a network and he had the ability to sell. And I didn't like that. I wanted something that there was a little bit more to it than just like I showed up and now I get to sell some stuff because I, I passed the test. And so that's why I went to law school. Uh, law school because I knew I had to get a skill. And so I was in limbo. Like in real life, I didn't have a law degree. And I still had the same mindset. My mom is a CPA. She has a skill set. And so I knew that I had to be a professional. I had to have a profession that then allows me to make money, not just in a job. Then allows me to make money and not have to go out there and sell something per se. Like I, I'm in sales now, but it's for my own business. And so that's kind of what I was saying. Like when you get that skill, you get security because you're not easily replaceable. But then also you have the ability to do what I do now, which is go outside and coach and consult and advise and mentor and create content, create all these different things based off of that skill set. So people need skills. It doesn't matter what skill that is. You need, might need to get your contractor's license. You might need to get your electrician's license. You might need to be a plumber, but you can't just be a no skill having as N word who's going to go out there and say, well, I guess I'll just work security and they're going to pay you $10 an hour and you're going to be miserable. Like people, it kind of frustrates me when I'm in, in LA and I see all these African-American people who are just working security jobs. It basically means they have no skills to be a security guard. Your job is stand at the door. Anybody can stand at the door. And what I realized today is I think that the reason why they follow African-American people around the store isn't even because we're suspicious. It's because they got to look like they're doing some kind of work. And so to actually do, <laughs> to actually do like the analysis, to look and see if somebody's really like, like, like a, a thief, they don't want to do that. They just want to say, okay, I'm just going to follow this guy around, blah, 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 blah. And so I really don't take it personal because I know a lot of these people like, they don't know any better. They're not very intelligent. So, I mean, there's no knock against security guards. Like, you got to get your money how you get it. But I, you got to – if you're working security, you got to also be skilling up. That's one thing my family did. My mom, she was working as a bookkeeper. She was skilling up. Me, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm skilling up. I'm learning. I'm reading. I'm researching. I'm, I don't read for nothing. Y'all think I just read for entertainment. I read because I'm looking for them gems. I'm like, how can I get to the next level? Oh, it's in a book. And so it's like, wherever I am now, I'll read that book, it gets me to the next level. And that's a skill. So skills pay the bills, man. Right, right, right. Hold on one second. Tweet talk. Yeah, back. Yeah, Erica Williams likes to talk about skilling up all the time. And things with security guards, like you said, yeah. They really don't want to, if you're st stealing something, they really don't want to confront you anyway. Most of them. Mm -hmm. They don't want that kind of confrontation. They, they don't want that drama. Really Man, it was, so, it was so embarrassing, though. I was at the mall today, and it was packed. It was packed. People were in there spending money, carrying bags. And I saw these two girls being followed by the cops. They were taking them out of the side. They, basically, they are kicking them out of the mall. And, so I'm a, and then as I walked around the corner, I kind of saw there's a police station inside of the mall. So what happened is I guess they took him into the police station, interrogated them, and they're like, we're going to just let you go. We don't come back here. But it was embarrassing because it was like two African-American girls. And I realized, like, we just got to work, man. Like, and it's so frustrating because it's, it's as simple as that. It's not some magic, some law, some anything. It's just go to work. That's it. Go to work. Go drive Uber. Go do something at nighttime. Do something. Create a podcast. Do something besides steal. Because it ain't going it, – it doesn't last. You might get away with it four or five times. They're going to get you number six. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Black Friday and all the mall and shopping, you said we could stimulate an entire economy just before Christmas spending. Yeah, 100%. So I'm promoting something called the Black Christmas Challenge, hashtag Black Christmas Challenge. And the challenge is this. I want people to spend and buy all their Christmas gifts from a Black-owned business. Um, there's so much money that gets spent during Christmas season because, I mean, you're buying stuff for people, you're buying gifts, you're doing all these different things. And these days, what's so amazing is there's a lot of African-American-owned businesses that aren't just shea butter companies. So we got 
lingerie companies out there. We have um, candle companies out there. We have watch companies out there. We, of course, have clothing companies out there. We have cell phone companies out there. We have a lot, which means that we don't actually need to go outside of our community to accomplish all these goals. Um, we just don't. And so what I found is that if you start doing the math and it's like, I had to really break it out, but let's just hypothetically say that there's a million black families in the United States. I'm pretty sure there's a lot more. And let's say on average, each family spends at least a thousand dollars. That means that's a billion dollars worth of black spending, a billion dollars that could be put into the black economy. Like that's big money. That's not a small, that's not just anything. And so I think that that's what we got to like really focus is, and I was, and a lot of this was kind of uh, motivated by the book, Black Fortunes, great book, still reading it, still getting through it. And they mentioned that, so many different things they mentioned, but they were talking about how segregation actually created a lot of wealthy black economies. The other is that Black Wall Street, that historic Black Wall Street that everybody rivals as the pinnacle of black wealth, wasn't even the pinnacle of black wealth. It was just another symbolism of black wealth. The reason why black Wall Street was important was because it was kind of like American in a sense where you could go there and not come from privilege and build a life for your family. But there is areas that we talk about the St. Louis area, Durham, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, of course, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, all these great black areas, pretty much every black area that's now impoverished was actually pretty prosperous back in the day. The problem is when we stopped having our own businesses and started stopped having our own institutions, all the money went out of the community and it went to the community of other people. And so I say all that to say that we have to be intentional about solving our own problems because first and foremost, nobody's ever going to solve our problems for us. And second, we can't just hope it works out. We got to do it on purpose. Like, meaning that there's going to be some sacrifices. There's going to be some challenges. And that's why I call it a challenge because it's going to be a challenge. You can't just go to Best Buy. You can't just go to Walmart or Target. You got to go and search out like what is a black owned board game company? Oh, I could buy somebody the in-house banking company. All those companies, it's just an excuse. It's an excuse for us to support all these black companies that you've probably seen. You want to support, you wanted to buy from. Now is your time to do it. You're already going to be buying people stuff anyway. Just, include a black owned company in there and let's see what we can create. Cause you just get the wheel rolling. Right. And it's like you said, challenges are supposed to stretch you. So if you don't know a black owned alternative, you might have to do some research and find one. Yep. And don't be a little B. <laughs> okay. So you say also, um, the older I get, the more I care about the business and law behind sports, movies, and music. Yeah, man. Um, in the beginning at a young age, you're just like, oh man, I can't wait to go pro. I can't wait to make a bunch of money. But these days I'm looking at the contracts. I'm looking at how much money they're going to make. I'm looking at how much money the owner's going to make. I'm looking at how much money you can make as an agent. I'm looking at what potential endorsement deals look like. I'm looking at the actual business of sports and entertainment, especially being in downtown Los Angeles and Los Angeles specifically, we're surrounded by entertainment money. And having a law degree, having a background in finance, I want to be able to tap into that in some capacity. So we've teetered, we've talked about the idea of like Thai Capital Pro and working with investments for professional athletes. But I kind of want to get into just management, like on a management level, like, oh, this is my roster of clients who I work with. And I have 10 to 15 clients that pay me 10 percent of their salary and I can do it that way. Um, so that's kind of like what I'm looking at now is. I guess it's because the veil's kind of removed and you kind of realize that like 33, I'm not going pro. So if I still want to be included in that, which is fun, I love pro sports, but I have no desire of playing and I, I won't ever get to that level. But my intelligence and my intellect would allow me to be an asset to a lot of these players that are coming up. And so what's cool about Southern California is you have all the pro teams, but you also have these great high school teams. You also have these great NFL te or, uh, college teams, there's so many around us that if you can tap into those players before they go pro and kind of establish that relationship or however it works, there's a lot of money to be made. And they need people who look like them because we might not think it's a big deal, but it is a big deal. You might not think 
that hiring a Jewish attorney or a Jewish financial advisor is a big deal, but it's huge. I was talking about this, but it's like when one of us becomes successful, a bunch of us become successful. And I said that because Provado Life is like Provado Life wins, I win. I, I might not win immediately or as a direct correlation between that, but I still win because they their influence grows and so my influence grows. And so we got to be intentional about promoting others, not competing with others. Because if I promote you and you win, I win. So think about this. If one of us wins and that thereby creates 10 wins, what if we promote 100 of us winning? Now we got a thousand of us winning. And so that's what we got to aim at. We got to say the more of us that are winning, the more of us that are going to be winning. So if I can promote you and pro, that's why I do it so much. People are like, why do you promote people for free? Why do you do it free? Because I'm trying to win. If I help right. you win, I'm a win. And so that's kind of where I stand with that. Yeah, I mean, people remember when, when, when you show them out, you, you support them without asking for anything. They, they remember, man. Yeah. Well, we got to support create- you. We got to create a community of that. It shouldn't just be like, oh, I can't, I can't share your stuff because uh, whatever. Like we have to take the approach that we're all in this together. We have to, um, we just have to. Yeah, man. Shout out to Provado Life. Invest as a team. Yep. He's always, he's always supporting everybody. Right. Um, so, so we're really looking. You're really looking to get into the uh, management side of sports. I would like to. Um, one of the cool things about being a business owner is I could do whatever the hell I want to do. So, therefore, if I, because it all falls under tie capital, I'm not going to do anything that's like completely far fetched. Has nothing to do with anything that I'm doing. That becomes tie capital pro. So we take the same approach, same branding, same colors, same team. And we supply it to sports management at that point in time. And me being the entrepreneur, I have to separate myself even from the management aspect. So at that point, I'm bringing in people and I'm letting them manage the athletes and I manage the managers on an entrepreneur level. Yes. I remember when uh, Master P had No Limit Sports and everything. Everybody was making fun of him. I mean, he had uh, Ricky, Ricky Williams in his contract. But I mean... P was thinking big, man. Man, Master P, that whole making fun of him and laughing at him, that thing resonates with me so much because people laugh at what they don't understand. I've been laughed at a lot from ideas. Um, But what's interesting about Master P is you look at all this stuff, some things work, some things don't work. The rap snacks worked. The noodles that they have out there is probably going to, I don't know if it'll work, but at least he's willing to be laughed at. A lot of people lose because they're not willing to be laughed at. They're not willing to put it out there in its basic fundamental level. And I, I kind of created that quote when I put it on my Instagram because it spoke to me. Any entrepreneur, like, you got to be willing to try something new, try something different. Because if all you do is what somebody else has done, that market's already been tapped. There's, there's no upside for you there. But if you hop out there and you're like, you know what? I'm going to do what Ray J has been doing. Ray J finally found an idea that worked and now he's worth 200 million. We as a culture have to get to the point where we're willing to be laughed at. We have to get to the culture where we're willing to create and innovate and do something different. We went from being an innovative and creative community to just being some consumers. We just consume what everybody else has created. Now we're not out there. Like back in the day, we were doing the inventing. We were doing the creating. We everything that's invented was by us. But now it's like they've they've convinced us that we don't have the the capacity to do those different things, and so we stopped doing it. You gotta be willing to be laughed at. You gotta be willing to get get out there, and that's how I invest. You invest in the places that people are are not willing to invest. You buy homes where they're not willing to buy homes. You buy stocks they're not willing to buy. That's how you win. If they're not laughing at you, you're headed towards average, in my opinion. Right. Uh, as a sidebar, I noticed you be you. You said you were going to take more action. You get get more involved in the um, invested in the investment club. I see you making the um, the votes, putting up the votes. Yeah, I man. See you, I see you getting active in there, man. I have, I have. Um, a part of it is the investment club ain't free no more. So it's a five dollar fee per member to participate in the club, and so I feel as though I owe them activity. 
I, I have to make it a point to put things in there, videos, engage, ask questions. And I don't know who said this. It might have been Greg Cardone, but what he was effectively saying is like, you shouldn't want anything for free. If you pay me, that puts me on notice to provide you top quality customer service. And you should want a high quality customer service product, not some little freebie, get by thing. But yeah, I've definitely been a lot more active um, in the Slack chat and proposing trades and really putting effort into that investment club because a lot of the reason why it grew the way it grew is because I was putting effort and energy into it. And then when I kind of stepped back and tried to be more passive, um, we kind of lost some momentum. So we got to build that back up and we will. Cool, because I mean, sitting on a fair amount of cash too. Yeah, a lot of money. Yeah. A lot of money. It's not being used up there, man. And I mean, me personally, no, no, no offense, but it's kind of like, well, I thought the whole point was to get stocks, not to sit on a big pile of cash. Right. You know what I mean? Well, the, one of the problems is the market wasn't giving us any opportunities. Everything was at the top. And so we were kind of waiting to see when an opportunity presented itself and we've seen some come and go um we've had some issues with votes we've had some issues with quorums but yeah we're yeah each club is just has a bunch of cash and the problem is the problem is this when i first started the investment club the goal wasn't to aim for a, a crazy high roi the goal was to take people who would normally be spending that money and then invest it and then learn as we go. And so it wasn't like I need to thoroughly analyze this and we need to maximize our portfolio and blah, blah, blah. blah. I was like, let's buy companies that we love guys and let's see how they perform and let's go forward. And we did that and we won. And I think we, what slowed us down is trying to make that right pick and trying to be super uh, strategic and buy at the right price and do all these different things. And that's why I'm not big on planning and analysis is you never do anything. You do all that mm -hmm. planning, all that thinking, and then you look up and it's six months later and you still haven't started. I'm more so like, let's start and let's maneuver to the finish line. But at least we're more making our way to the finish line as opposed to just sitting at the starting line, tying our shoes. And a lot of people were at the, at the, at the starting line and they're like picking out their shoes, picking out their outfit, making sure that they have the wristband, making sure that they have their music in their iPhone. And I'm already running. I'm out there. I'm just like psh, playing on the iPhone as I go. Let me find something to listen to as I'm running. Not like I got to get it all ready. <laughs> like, like, and as, as, as arrogant as it might seem, I'm kind of an accomplished individual. And so one of my frustrations is I get around people and they want to tell me what we should be doing. And like I had that issue with um, the rental property is and no offense but i was telling gabe i was like this is how this should be done this is what we should be doing and he was giving me pushback and telling me what he thinks and i was like bro no offense but you ain't been doing this for two years you should be listening when people come around me your job is to listen your job is not to tell me what you think and mm -hmm. i'm that kind of person when i get around people who who have what i want as well i used to work for the big jew al and Al was like, he would always tell me, like, it's not your job to tell me what you think. It's your job to bring me information. Bring me the information and let me come to a conclusion. I don't really care what you think. I'm 70 years old. I have $200 million. Like, I don't care what you think, little Charles. Like, <laughs> to my level, then you can tell me what you think. And that he, that he, I don't, I'm not humble around a lot of people, but I was definitely humble around Al until I didn't have to be. So you said, Wealth is a mentality, not a salary. So, man, I'm actually glad you brought this up because it came full circle. The premise of that tweet was somebody was like, you can't get rich making $30,000. You need to be making good money in order to get rich. And I was like, y'all stupid, man. Y'all are really dumb. Because my problem with that is, is people use that as an excuse to just be poor. The, the, the statement becomes like, oh, since I don't have money, therefore I can't make money or I can't get rich. And what was interesting is I came across a tweet and they were like, man, there's a girl, she makes $20,000 a year as a waitress in Detroit and she owns 10 rental properties. 
And when I saw that, the reason why Keenan is because I know her. That's Ashley. She was on the podcast, the Millionaire Podcast, also on the Bigger Pockets Podcast. And I talked to her off and on through Instagram. But the reason why it really resonated with me is because she made $20,000 and now she has 10 properties. But somebody on Twitter just said that it wasn't possible. On Twitter, they're like, you can't do that unless you make big money, but she did it. And that's why I have the podcast in the first place, because every single thing that a motherfucker tells you that you can't do is something that somebody's already done. I don't yeah. even like the word can't. Don't tell me what you can't do. Don't tell me what's too expensive. Don't, 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 me, don't tell me what's too hard. Don't tell me what's impossible. If there's somebody out there doing it, it's possible for you. And it was possible for her. But she did different, and she didn't splurge on her tax refunds. She took her tax refunds and she bought homes. A lot of people take their tax refunds and they buy Gucci. And they say, oh, we can't do it because we broke. No, I'm not entertaining that idea anymore. I don't even want to hear you say it. And if I hear somebody say it, I'm going to slap them. Because it just, it just gives people a reason to be broke and be poor and blame everybody else but themselves and their decisions. And they come on here. And my problem with it isn't that they keep it for themselves. Then they project it on other people. They start telling other people what they can't do. They're like, no, you can't because you don't make enough money. It's impossible for you because you don't make enough money. That's what really upsets me. It's not even so much that they're defeated. They can keep their defeatedness. It's that they come on the internet and they try to project it on other people. They try to limit other people. They try to handicap other people. That is what makes me upset. And so when you see an Ashley story, that is true for anybody. But what people do is they justify what they need to get. They say, oh, I need furniture. I need to go on a vacation. I need to get this Gucci purse. I deserve. Like, no. And he, the crazy part about it is you don't even have, and this is the thing, is I put out another tweet, and I was like, I have people who have just heard stuff, and they're over here debating somebody that studies it. I study this stuff. I read about this stuff, and I know that it's possible. I created an options course because you can literally take hundreds of dollars and turn it into thousand dollars in options. You can take thousands and turn it to 10,000. Take 10,000, turn it to 100,000. You can literally flip money through the stock market and then you take that money in the stock market and you put it into real estate or you stack all your windfalls because you might be low income, but you're going to get a windfall. It might come in a tax return. It might come in a lawsuit. It might come in so many different ways. But if every time you get a windfall, you blow it, you don't get to blame anybody. There are black people in America that are doing things that black people think that can't be done. And at this point in time, my responsibility is to stop talking to people who don't think it can get done. I don't even want to talk to you. I'm not even going to debate you. Only reason why I even debated her is because she's a lawyer. And so I saw that she had the, the JD behind her name, and I was like, well, I'm going to probably go back and forth with her. But if it was like some idiot, I'd be like, I'll block. If it was somebody with like an Ann on Abby, I'll block. Whatever, man. Whatever you think. Right, whatever. But like, I just feel like, how do, you, how do you make that comment? And then you got somebody in Detroit who owns 10 homes. And the crazy part about it is she owns way more than 10 now. She owns 10 homes. She owns way more homes now. Some dude was like, I wonder what her ROI is. Her ROI is off the charts, fam. Why you <laughs> to, like, like, why do you have to find a way for it not to work? People are whack, man. It, it kind of it frustrates me because it's like we can't move forward, not because it's not possible, because our mentality, and that's what I mean. It's our mentality, not our income, not our salary, not your paycheck, it's your mentality. Mentality isn't just, I know how to find financial opportunities. Mentality is, I'm going to get it by any means. Mentality is, you pay me this, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get that. Mentality is, nothing's holding me back. Nothing's preventing me from getting what I want. That's mentality. It's not just about like the, are you financially intelligent? Do you create passive income? Do your assets pay for your liabilities? That's one element of it. But... You got a Saturday, you got a Sunday, you got evenings. Are you getting drunk? Are you getting paid? Are you getting high? Are you getting to your goals? A lot of people are doing the former and then blaming white people for the latter. I remember I saw that little exchange. She's talking about stop telling people they could invest the crumbs. Yeah. I'm like, what else should you do with it? But right. anyway. Right. People, man, the crazy part about poor people is they spend a lot of money. They got vices. They buy cigarettes, alcohol. Lottery drugs, tickets. Lottery tickets. Like, they give away money. Almost, I saw a status like 80% of millionaires are self-made. First gen. 
And if you look back, a lot of those dudes started working in the mailroom, started working in whatever. It doesn't even have to be like the thing is, is people act like low income is a death sentence, as if you're going to make low income income forever. Right. If you make 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, you better be working to get your salary up. It shouldn't just be like, this is where I am. This is what we got right here. We just here forever. Like, that is what I mean by mindset. Like, if you, my, I was, my father-in-law, he, when he first, like, had kids, my, my wife and her sister, he was working multiple jobs. Now he does whatever he wants to do. His job tells him whatever he, what, what his job bends his, over to him. And so, but mm-hmm. until he got there, he had to do what he had to do. But the key is you got to get it by any means. So he worked one job, he worked another job, another job, he was working three jobs at one point in time. And now he doesn't have to do that, but he gets the money. So it's not a matter of if they're going to give it to you. This is America. You got to go out and get it by any means at any point in time. You don't have the ability to say it can't get done in this country. Man, I know, I know people in Iran, there are things that we take for granted where if you even bring it up to them, they'll laugh at you. We were at lunch and they were talking about, what were they talking about? Um, one of the things, there's uh, so many other things, but, uh, one of them was that you, of course you can't openly criticize the government. And I was like, wow, that really exists. Like you literally cannot do it. Like it's a wrap for you. If you openly criticize the government, um, there's a lot of other things. I can't think of what it was. Oh, alcohol in Iran. You literally can't drink alcohol at all. Not 18, not 21, not on certain days, like no alcohol at all. If they even smell it on you, you're going to jail. Isn't that crazy? If they smell <laughs> alcohol on you, like he said that a police officer walks up to him and started sniffing him to see if he smelled like alcohol and he was going to jail if he smelled like alcohol. There's so many things that we take for granted, but the sad thing is in taking those things for granted, we're not taking advantage of the opportunities that exist in America. So I just, I want people to, 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 to shed that, that I don't know where they got it from. Actually, I know where they got it from. They got it from their conditioning. Because if they read the book Black Fortunes, you will see we were some dope people. We were. Just like in Tulsa. Like, I put out that tweet, that, that tweet and they were talking about how, like, in Tulsa, they were tired of the race shit. So they were walking around with guns on their, on their hips. They are like, we ain't, I'm not putting up with this shit. And we would never hear, you would never, you would never hear a story like that. Any movie, any story is, yes, Massa. Anything you say, Massa. Oh, let me move on out of here. And then, like, and like you never see it. You never see strong black people in those movies, ever. Not, not ones that win. If they're strong, they end up getting fucked up in the end. And so, like, yeah. if we knew our history, that's why I said that our history, as told by everybody else, is fake news. It benefits them. It makes them look great, and it makes us look whack. Yeah. It's not our history, though. That's just what you were told. If you knew the truth, you would rise up. We don't know the truth. We just know what they told us. And then we go on existing in some stuff that they told us that benefits them and makes us lose. And we're so profound. We're so educated. We're so right about what's, what somebody else told us that isn't actually in our favor. As like you said, you become what you call yourself. 100%. Um, there's so much power in names and of course legend Billy I mean you definitely believe that (laughs) right no but uh, I forgot I forgot what I oh I think I was listening to Daniel's I was listening to Daniel Caesar interview and Daniel Caesar isn't even his name and I thought that was so crazy so many famous people so many successful people changed their name and I think there's a correlation between that. There's a correlation between changing your name and success. There's a correlation between, because it allows you to define yourself. Unfortunately, sometimes your parents can define you and your parents don't even know what you really can be. They just know what they wanted to call you. They know what they were thinking at the time. And so sometimes you got to change your name to where you are and where you want to be and where you want to go. And that's what I do. That's what I've done. And it's worked for me. Hunter Ty Law. At one point in time, Hunter Ty Law. Now it was Ty Billy. Then it was Ty Billy. Now it's Legend Billy. I don't know what's going to be next. But I know that names project where you want to go. And it's so funny when I see people like tag me like Legend Billy. Like, 
and they start calling you it too, and you got to step into it. So it's like, I know I have a chip on my shoulder. I got to really rise to the occasion. Yeah, but now you legend Billy. He got much further to go, man. Right, <laughs> right, right. But the thing is, is like a, another reason why I said that is because the opposite is like, if you call yourself something negative, you're gonna become something negative. So if you call yourself an N-word, you're gonna become an N-word. You call yourself a B-word, you're gonna become a B-word. And you look at it and that's what they are. People who use that language, that's exactly what they are. They're B's and N's. Unfortunately, they don't gotta be that. But if you elevate your mindset, elevate what you call yourself, that's what you walk into. And so that's what I'm trying to get to is, I want us all, like I don't even use the N-word or the B-word unless I'm sick of y'all. That's sometimes I use it. <laughs> but for the most part, I don't use that word. I haven't used it in a long time. Yeah, me neither. But um, you said, y'all problem is you aim for rich instead of freedom. Rich isn't a number, fam. Freedom <laughs> is. Yeah, um, I just feel like we've talked about this before, but like the idea of wealth as opposed to like financial freedom. Financial freedom is when your passive income equals your your living expenses or it's greater than your living expenses. That's a number because you know what your living expenses are. Maybe you spend $3,000 a month. That means you need $3,000 worth of passive income. That's a whole lot more attainable than millions upon millions of dollars. Like if we're keeping it at a hundred, like $3,000 of passive income, like that's it. People are letting $3,000 keep them from freedom. That's amazing. If you really think about it, $3,000. And I think that, um, that's just kind of where I want us to go because it's very easy to say that something that doesn't have a defined number is impossible. And that's my whole thing is I want people to stop using the, the idea that something is impossible to keep them on the sidelines or to keep them miserable or to keep them talking about what other people have that they don't have. If we knew that it only took $3,000, then you could start reverse engineering how to get that $3,000. There is a 10 unit apartment complex that just came down my timeline. That one deal, which costs $250,000, is your $3,000 a month. So that makes your freedom $250,000 as opposed to millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. And so that's kind of where I want you to go. Is I want people to find the tangible goal as opposed to talking about what's not possible because it's this big, illusory, imaginary thing that doesn't really exist and has no form. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, I think it was Chris Johnson was talking about like, or maybe it's Wall Street Trapper. Talking about, yeah, I think it's Wall Street Trapper talking about replacing bills. Like you find one of those stream of income that replaces one bill, maybe it's 50 bucks a month, but that's one bill you get rid of. And it brings you a step closer to freedom. You just keep going like that. Yep, I love it. I love it. That's definitely the goal, like for me, I'm like, man, I need an asset to take care of private school for my son. I need an asset to, because I already want an asset to pay for college. But I'm like, college is one. If you don't get your kid in the right college or like right middle school and high school, going to the right college gets tougher and tougher, man. It's possible, but it's hard, man. I don't know. I don't got no kid. I mean, I do have a kid, but not really like, yeah, he's not born yet. But shout out to little Todd Millie. Future. <laughs> No, the weirdest thing about it is I keep thinking he's going to come out the womb like me. Like, nah, he's going to want to do some kid stuff. <laughs> he's not going to hop out the room like, dang, dad, let's go buy a building. He's going he's gonna to want to, like, watch PJ Mask and all that stuff. So I got to let him be a kid and not rush Right. Him. He's not coming out uh, analyzing deals. Right. Right. Until he's, like, five or so. Him- right. Five, maybe five. <laughs> Give him a break. All right, so you say you only have to start from zero one time. After that, it should be all upside. Yeah, that, that tweet's kind of self-explanatory, but it all is rooted in that conversation where she's over here talking about what you can't do, what's not possible. Imagine if you stack that tax refund or you save your money up, 100 bucks per paycheck. Like you never started from zero, but if you're investing that money, if you have it working, then you can win. Unfortunately, what I realize is a lot of people don't know how to invest. They don't understand the, the idea of investing. And so I can understand why that could sound, sound kind of difficult. Um, we got classes for you at tiecapital.com or gumroad.com backslash tiecapital so you can learn how to do that. Um, however, um, you only, like there, 
we over we're over here talking about like what you don't have, what you can't do. But if you save it and make it permanent, like you'll never not have money. You'll always have some net worth. I saw a stat that like the average African American woman has a net worth of five hundred dollars. That's insane. But they're over here. Five hundred or just five dollars? At first, that's like five dollars. Uh, oh, I heard five hundred recently, but it might okay. it might be five. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. So, um, we got to be diligent about what we're doing. But you never know what's going to happen. You never know what kind of windfall you're going to walk into. You never know if you're going to get a bonus. My thing is I always tell people, like, stack the unexpected money. If you weren't expecting it, then save it. If you weren't expecting it, just put it away. And now you have net worth. Now you have wealth. Now you can put that towards something. And that's just kind of where you get to go. Mm. All right. So this next tweet, I know we touched on this before, but it's been a while. It's been a while. So you said the business saves others, not just you. Yeah. Your firm will save others, not just you. I think we got to touch on this again. So the reason why I bring that up is because I was talking to Real Estate Cash and Real Estate Cash, he was talking about how like his Airbnb company is going to be managed by a sister. And I was like, because it's a business and a business requires people to work within that business. And so you're going to need somebody to, to manage this, manage that, do this, do that. And that's why Asian people build up the business because they know that the business saves other people. Businesses build jobs. Your job is somebody's business. Therefore, if you create a business, you also create jobs for other people. And that's what I mean by like, you have energy. You can either use that energy to build a business or use that energy to work a job. If you work a job, you get a paycheck. Congratulations, you get a paycheck. What are you going to do with that paycheck? You can't hire anybody with your paycheck. You can't pay for anybody with your paycheck. All your paycheck does is allow you to get to the next paycheck. That's all paychecks do. Paychecks allow you to get to the next paycheck. It's just over broke. Whereas if you create a business, that business now creates jobs. That business now brings resources into the community. And so we have to look at, you have these areas where there's food deserts. And people will say, oh, it's a food desert. Well, fam, why don't you go and start a grocery store and it won't be a food desert anymore. And then you create a wealth for yourself, you create a job for the community and you solve the problem. Like that's the way we have to think. And back in the day, that's what we did do because they had no choice. And so I feel like, dang, my hair looks really fly right now. I don't know, maybe because it's laying down. I went, you know, I went crazy for a little while and now my hair is like short and laying down. It looks really good. Um, but the business saves other people. And if I could just get people to focus on that, just focus on building a business. We see it all the time. We see people who have businesses and they're retiring their moms and retiring their wives and doing all these cool things because the business income is so much greater than your working income. Your business income is probably about five times what your working income is. Um, I'm pretty sure like at one point in time, it was uncommon for me to make more money in my business than on my job. Now it's kind of expected. And the crazy part about it is I still keep the job. I had a very, like, I'm at a point now, and there's so, and there's so much more hours. The business has more leverage because you're going to make more money with less effort. And also, you can be doing it through the internet, through social media. This is a function of our business. This podcast right here is a function. Putting out content is allowing us to market and brand this, which then allows us to grow the business because it's going to spin. People are going to listen to it in the gym. They're going to listen to it on their car. And so that's why content is so powerful. I don't do it for the money. I do it because I enjoy doing it. It just happens to create money. And so the business is just important, man. Like we have a tax company and that allows my mom to do different things. It allows like, let's say hypothetically speaking, you have a tax company, which is a side company. You bring an extra 10 grand in tax season. You know what you can do with that 10 grand? You can go on a vacation. The vacations you couldn't have gotten from your job because you would have been scrimping and scraping, saving, and trying to do that. And so, like a lot of times, I tell people like it's easier to create another stream than it is to save from your mainstream. Sometimes you've got to create another stream to, to. Most people will never save ten grand a year, but your business can generate ten grand a year. Most people won't save a thousand dollars in a month, but your business can generate a thousand generate a thousand dollars in a month. We live in a in a, a very very unique time and opportunity, and we got to take advantage of it. I'm taking advantage of it. And hopefully Raphael is taking advantage of it well by creating more streams and helping us monetize this podcast, fam. We got to monetize it, fam. 
Yeah, yeah. Be on it, be on it, be on it. 2020, 2020. <laughs> well, we'll see what we can do by the end of this month. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, let's see. Last one, let me wrap it up. Oh, actually, that was the last one. What? I have, I have one that I want to talk about that we haven't touched. I just saw it on my Instagram. It says, find a problem. That's how you invest. We talked about this before. I actually took that from Master P. Mm -hmm. um, because somebody came up and they said, well, how do you invest? Where should I invest? He said, find a problem, fam, find a problem. He was like, if you want to buy a house, if you want to invest in real estate, you go find that problem property, you make it great again. And that's how you win. If we can just grasp that simple concept across the board. One thing I found being an investor and professional investor, I can call myself a professional investor now is that's what I do. If a stock, announces a product and the product fails at launch like Tesla did, I'm buying that stock all day. And that's what I did. They went down 6%. I bought a bunch of it that day. It's a problem. When Chipotle was going through that stuff, they went down to like $380 per share. Now it's back at like high sevens. Find problems. Only find problems. If it's not a problem, do not mess with it. If it's great and it's roses and everybody's seeing it as praises, that's not the investment that you want to buy. Because it might make you money, but it not, it's not going to make you the big money. Let's say, for example, you buy Apple at 100 bucks per share, and it's Apple, and it's doing great stuff. And let's say it goes up to 110 bucks per share. You made 10%. Whereas if you buy something like Microsoft that was selling at like 50, because everybody thought that Microsoft was left for dead, and now Microsoft is selling it $100 per share. That means you would have doubled your money. The same $100 is now double as opposed to being up 10%. And that's why you have to find problems and not find pretty stuff. That's a bar. Find problems, not pretty stuff. Bar. Hold on. Let me see. I got one more. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Yo, check out the Black Friday Thai Capital sale. I'm going to run it. We're going to keep running it. Um, tomorrow is the last day. Gumroad.com backslash Thai Capital. The code is Black Wealth. Everything is half off. Options trading course. LLC formation, LLC how to file um, course, all that cool stuff. The book is on there. Check it out. And we're only going to create more content. We might create a how to create a podcast uh, course sponsored by Rafa or uh, hosted by Raphael. Also check out trade and travel investor. Uh, www.investor101.org. She has $200 off. Also check out Hood Estates. They're selling their tricking class. That's normally $500 for $100. Erica has all her cool stuff. 24-7 watches, 17th watches. What up, Raphael? Yeah, shout out to Provado, Provado Life. Uh, to Provado Life. Mindset Matter Tees. Tasha, go, gotta stay. Um, everybody at Todd Capital, that's where it all started from. Todd Man, Capital. we're growing. Todd Cap. That's the uh, big ball of brand for the regular folks out here. <laughs> the shirt is so cool, man. It's all foil and stuff. Yeah, no, man. I Big like cool. it. Big foil brand. I don't know, man. I thought they had some nice stuff, man. They should definitely should not give up on that. Yeah, it was a little bit pricey, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think Lonzo's making a mistake just building up. Yeah, he doesn't know any better. Yeah, he does. That's one. Of the, that's one of the sad things is like, he has so much money, but he doesn't know that he's making a mistake. And then you have all these people that have like competing interests. Like, just come on to Nike, fam. Come on over here. Right. We'll treat you. We'll treat you good. Man, that shit is whack. He's sure excited. He could be putting his own money into it now and improving it if he doesn't like it so much. Like, right. Yep. I don't know. He should be talking to that guy at. Um, he was on The Breakfast Club, Devlin Carter. I don't know if you ever saw that one. Oh, uh, I didn't see it, but I heard about it. Yeah, that guy's doing some good stuff like along those lines, but I think with better quality. And yeah, he was there's... saying too that he was saying too he spoke to um he spoke a lot to Master P about mm -hmm. his his sneakers because the sneakers that he's got now he's saying Master P his, his profit margin is too slim, mm -hmm. so he said he was talking to Master P about. Giving them some 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 pointers and stuff. Hmm. I'm not sure if he's really taking them, but he said he talked to him. Yeah. 
But he definitely, Lonzo just definitely put some of his own money into a big ball brand and push it, really push yeah. it hard. Yeah. But, I mean, okay. it, it takes time. And you got to build up a brand over time. Like we, like I always say, like Amazon is a 30 year old company. Um, if you've ever seen like the first Walmart, the first Walmart compared to like Walmart now is night and day. I think the first Walmart was called like Walton's or something. It was trash. It was a little storefront. Yeah. Like people, and this is one of the unfortunate things is it shows our immaturity in business and that we expect it to happen overnight. We don't have the ability to kind of suffer through that first iteration that isn't going to be pretty, isn't going to be sexy, but like eventually it's, it's going to come to fruition if you just keep working that plan. And that's why we keep working this podcast, keep working tied capital, keep working tied acquisitions. It'll come to fruition. People, they want to see it in a year. There's a, a quote and it says something along the lines of like people lose because they want it to happen fast when life is long. Like life is long. 30 is the starting point. If like 30 isn't the end, like people think it is. 35 isn't the end. 40 is not the end. 45 is not the end. Most millionaires don't get rich until like 53. Right. We're over, here, we're over here like, I got to get rich by 30 or else I'm whack. Like, no, if you don't get rich by 30, you're just average. And what's worse is a lot of us aren't coming from the circumstances that would even allow you to get there at 30. So to expect you to get there at 30 is just insane. It is, man. Everybody out there listening, remember, like Charles said, the business of you could pay you so much more money than any job could ever and would ever pay you. 100%. So get started 100%. on you, LLC, gumroad.com slash Todd Capital, 50% off, 24 hours. You got to do it. Jump on it. With the uh, discount code Black Wealth. Black Wealth, right? Yes, sir. 50% off on everything. So grab that, people. Grab that. 2020 is fast approaching. Got to get on it. Got to get on it now. Don't wait till January 1st. So, yeah, don't wait. Don't wait till January 1st. At least get the ball rolling now. So you can hit 2020 running. And um, this time of year, I like to read um, The Magic of Thinking Big every December. You ever read that one? Um, I've skimmed it. I haven't like read it, read it in depth. I like that one. Another uh, book recommendation. I'm not, not recommendation, but I just picked up one today. Football for is it football for a dollar? I think it is huh. about the USFL. Um, back in '83, they tried to come up with a football league in the springtime. Mm. They shook things up. They got Herschel Walker. They shook things up. Donald Trump was a was an owner. Yeah. That fell sued them and everything. It just started, but it looks like an interesting read so far. Yes. But anyway. I, he mentions that in his uh in his book, The Art of the Deal. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. So I I I I'm I'm curious to see what they say about him in the book. Right. It looks like they're trying to say from like the, the overview, like they're trying to say he pretty much kind of brought it down or something like that. Uh, His ego. That's that's what they s- sort of seem to be saying. But uh, I haven't really read it too much yet. I wouldn't but, doubt that. <laughs> anyway, Tweet Talk episode 24 is in the books. Yeah, it's lit. Yeah, but black people, just remember, don't be a little bee, start a little business. We are the source, and we are out. I got to make that into a shirt tonight. Peace.